Well, how did I start in show business? Well, I was born in show business. My parents, my mom, used to be a, a bareback rider. She'd ride horses. And my dad, he was more of a, like you see with a carnival, he'd have concessions around the circuses as he traveled around. And my grandfather was a famous clown in the United Kingdom called Joey the Clown, Joey Biddle. So I spent most of my early years as um, a clown, learning techniques to make a living out of the entertainment industry. I picked up a guitar when I was about nine and started learning how to write songs because my grandfather used to play the banjo. And then from there, I went on to um, um, working in like from carnivals to seaside resorts, whatever work I could, because it was pretty a low time just when I was young. It was a low time in the United Kingdom. There wasn't much work around. People were, it was a very dull period. And uh, when the circus came to town, everybody got excited. Oh, there you go. So from there I went on to, uh, as I got into my teens more, I went on to London where I worked as an apprentice with Brian Somerville and Alan McDougall who were publicists for the Beatles and a lot of famous uh, British acts. Cutting a few uh, years here and there, all of a sudden there was a big Bugaloo audition. And I went off to the Bugaloo audition. In fact, I was at Apple Records that day. It was... Um, 1969, yeah, 68, 69, I went to Apple to get a job. My friend Terry said, John, I'll get you a job there. So I went to get a job. As soon as I got there, he said, John, have you heard there's a big audition they're having down at Manchester Square for the new monkeys? I went, ooh. He said, get down there and give it a try. So I picked up my guitar, because I actually was there at Apple. I left it there. He said, yeah, go cool, get down there. So I took my guitar. And I, not, I went down to Manchester Square, and they're just, I mean, I was late in the auditions. They've already been through about five or 600 or 1,500, I don't know how many. There was, they were just thinning out the IQ character. So my timing was good. I went in there, and there was only four of us left in this room, and they, they eliminated the one guy, then there was three of us left in the room. It was me, a gentleman called John Reed, and another gentleman called Phil Collins. We were the last three that were going to be picked for the IQ Bugaloo character. So we played a song, played the guitar, played a song to Marty. They looked, he said, OK, OK. Come back, I went back one more time, then that was it. I went back home. Then the next day, I left a contact number through Apple. I think it was Terry's number, because I didn't have a telephone at the time. And he called me and said, hey, get over here, you've got the job. So I rushed down to Manchester Square, went down there, and you're IQ Bugaloo. Well, when I first met the, my other fellow Bugaloos, John and Caroline and Wayne, um, it was the second day. And they're already kind of compared to, kind of sizing us all up, look at this fellow and, you know, this look for this. And, they were sizing us up and then the one thing there was like two Johns in the band, you know, John McAdoo, John Philpot. So um, one of us was supposed to change our name, but we never did, you know, we never did. But working with John was nice because he was like a fellow musician. He was a good little drummer and I liked, so we kind of had a lot in common. The acting side, which in a way, I guess I did have a bit of acting experience coming from the circus where you're thrown in the ring, right? You know, it's like do or die. It's like throwing them in the lions. You better be good. There's no rehearsal. Get out there and do it, you know. With Caroline and, and Wayne, they were more from the acting school, you know, trained actors. So in a way, we kind of fed one another. It was a, fa a good balance. With Caroline and Wayne, we'd watch them, me and John, to get little acting tips because we would throwing her into the arena dry. There was no, you know, acting school, even though we did spend a little bit of time at Phil Collins' mom's place, Joan Collins, which was the Barbara Speaks School in London. We spent a bit of time there. There were learners out of dance and tap dance and all that kind of ham stuff. But watching Caroline and Wayne kind of helped us because we were musicians. We only know how to look forward and keep the beat. 
So it was a nice balance. It was magical because we all got on great as friends. Never was there a dull moment, friction or any anything. Everybody was just the best of pals, like we've always been pals forever and ever, you know. Coming to the States, it was fantastic. All of a sudden, you know, we left cold, damp London and was sunny California. That was fun. And, and just them first two or three days was just magical. We met like Howard Keel, we met, um, we went to the Hamburger Hamlet up there on Sunset and, and I believe it was a guy from Mission Impossible was there that night. So we met all these stars, all just boom, 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 boom. And it, in, in a way it was comfortable for me because it reminded me of that family feeling you got with the musicians in the old days in London where everybody was in one another's band or you were always helping your mate out whatever way you could. But the Hollywood scene to me was like coming home. It was the same feeling of the circus families, how they all look after one another and they're always trying to help you on your way. All I got from, from coming to California was fantastic. The weather just blew me away and the, the, the vibe of working in that atmosphere was just, it was beautiful. You know, it's like, oh, comfort, comfortable. And working with Sid and Marty, Sid was so helpful. He'd really, you know, with compassion, you know, just push you gently into that character. You know, John, you're just a shy character. Just be a shy person. You, you know, you're okay. And it was just like, all of a sudden, boom, and the next, next few minutes we're in front of the camera shooting a show, you know? When we went home at night, after we filmed all day, we'd go straight home to Los Feliz, where we stayed at the time. Then our assistant from Sid Marty Croft, Miss Jean Anderson, who looked after us, she'd eventually indoctrinate us into Hollywood. She'd take us to a famous restaurant or a movie, a drive-in movie theater, which blew us away, drive-in movie, you know. And then she'd take us to um, uh, the stores, like at that time it was, uh, Davy Jones had a, a little place that was like a disco, like a, a boutique style, London style boutique to take us to Davy's place. And I knew Davy from London and um, we'd go to his place and hang out with him a few times. And um, it was a trip. I mean, we had the mamas and the papas going on in them days and Frank Zappa. So we were this kind of a mixed crowd of people we, saw, we started hanging around with, which was from black and white, you know, from Martha Ray, uh, Billy Barty, to Frank Zappa, to the monkeys, you know, I was like, I just felt I was back in the circus. In a way, you know, we we're pretty fortunate. I mean, we, a roof over our head, transportation, fed, free meals a day, and a shot at going for the big time. I mean, Marty give us all a shot. Marty and Sid, got to take my hat off them. They said, look, we don't know which way this is going to go. We could be the next monkeys or who knows. We're going to give it a shot. They gave us a good shot and they looked after us well. You know, they kept us away from the craziness and they, they paid us well. And they were pretty sad when we didn't get picked up at the end of the, the, end of the day. When they didn't pick up the other, another season of the Bugaloos, we were all sad together because we saw it developing into something really good. It could have, we were getting more creative near the end, you know. I guess that's the way it goes, you know and everybody was getting more into it. The Bugaloos was not just John, Caroline and Wayne. There was a lot more behind the Bugaloos. We had Hal Yogler, who was our writer, who wrote songs and produced the, the musical side of the Bugaloos. And at the time, that musical time, we were going, we were going to people like Neil Diamond for songs. We were looking at the, the famous, famous writers that wrote all the Monkees hits as well. And, we were trying to find something different. Hal Yogler, he gave us a tranquil, peaceful sound that seemed to just fit in with the show. We went pop. There was no pop hooky gimmicks or, or repetitive kind of songs that you hear over and over again in that era, you know. We had a mellow sound that worked with the show. So they did a good job. And it was fun working with the music side. The technical side was big too. We had, you know, innovative people in the show. We had George Deby, who was our lighting manager, who, who director, sorry, who had to light 
for chroma key, which was brand new at the time, uh, which gave us our visual effects. And also, um, we had some great old timers that used to work with John Wayne and, you know, the Paramount squad we had there. All, all pro it was just a pleasure to work with them. They were pro, just beautiful. And of course, we had the writing skills of, of, um, of Fenton Murray and uh, headed by Cy Rose. And Cy, you know, was always pumping us for good, good lines. You know, is that a good word? Give me some Cockney. That was a daily thing. Give me some Cockney, you know? So he'd, ask, he'd love Wayne because, you know, Wayne being a you know, black boy from London with a Cockney accent was a big novelty. It was a big novelty. Every time we go to a wrestling or something, you could see the people were really thrilled by that. We should have played on that more, we, which we did in a few episodes, but we should have played on that more in other ways. Martha Ray, I, lo I loved her from the start, you know. She, I, never, when I, feel, I never knew who Martha Ray was when I came to the, to the United States. I mean, she was an American icon, you know, I was from the Beatles and Rolling Stones era and, you know, I knew who Chuck Berry was or Little Richard, but I never knew who Martha Ray was. Once I got to know her, I fell in love with her because we clicked. She loved clowns and she was from the vaudeville background. And of course, she'd done all that fabulous work with Bob Hope. But with me having a circus background, once we got to know one another, we just became good buddies. When I think back on the Bugaloos and the show, the whole gang, it was pretty innovative at its time. The Crofts, you know, we were a live cartoon, you know. There wasn't, it was just Disney and Hanna-Barbera and, and then there was Sid Marty with their puppet magic. We tried to cross over with that. See, we came out 69, 70. Things were changing. So I feel we kind of were just the last of that golden era of good television, you know, good, clean fun. So in a way, that's the way I picture it and see it myself. I see that era. It, it was a, you know, uh, but what really blows me away. Today we have fans in their 50s and 60s that still write to us. On, on my website, on the Bugaloo website, you see all the fans there from all over the world. And whenever the show shows somewhere like in Japan or Australia, all of a sudden there's a flush of new fans and they're just young children in love with that show. So it's really nice. It's like, you know, you become a little niche in time, you know, therefore everybody to enjoy.